So what is the problem with the DSD? Well, the, uh, um, here I put down some of the issues, but perhaps one of the most important issues is the, is the issue number three, that all the mastering software, everything that we have, that everybody uses, because the CD you listen to is not, is not directly from the microphone to your speaker, but it's been processed. There was a recording engineer, there was a mastering engineer. All mastering today that exists, exists only in PCM format. There is not much you can do with DSD directly. You can perhaps change the volume, but that's about it. So as a result, even when the record says it's DSD, it has effectively been converted to PCM for uh, mastering purposes. And so at the end, you can convert it back to DSD if you like, and that's what's done. But unfortunately, that kills the original idea of getting rid of those interpolation filters. So we're back to using the interpolation filters. And then at the end, we're artificially converting it to a DSD. That is the issue number three that is perhaps the weakest point of the DSD idea. The, um, the issue number two is equally important. When the DSD was originally created, it was a one-bit format. Since then, the world moved on. The chip designers quickly realized that one bit DAC does not give you the dyna dynamic range that you want, and the one bit designs were abandoned approximately 10, 15 years ago towards three bit designs and then later to five bit modulators. That's something that's not taken into account. So, as a result, when you're converting it to one bit, you're actually throwing away the bits that the DAC is capable of because the DAC itself. You cannot buy a commercial DAC chip today that's a one-bit DAC chip. All the chips that receive the DSD formats, they're actually three-bit or five-bit modulators, which will then artificially, which are not using all the bits that the chip is capable of. So as a result, this one-bit issue is sort of, um, again, there's a loss involved that it's mismatched with the current technology that's, uh, that's commonly available. Then there is issues of standardization, and most uh, importantly as well from a technical point of view, the DSD system uses a lot of dithering in order to work properly. And this uh, heavy amount of dithering, it's actually high frequency noise, which when it gets into analog circuits like preamplifiers and uh, power amplifiers after it, it tends to react with the, uh, with the input circuits in such a way as to produce another set of distortions. So a huge amount of dithering noise is always uh, an issue with the analog circuits that follow. So as a result, um, because of some of these reasons, DSD format, as well as standardization issues and equipment, never really obtained penetration. And in my view, the idea was excellent, but the implementation did not quite work out how it was intended to be. So now let's see what can we do with today's technology. Times move on, we're now to 3-bit modulators, 5-bit modulators, and we are up to the chips that can convert at much uh, higher sample rate. So the argument I'm going to make is that 384 kilohertz audio actually has a chance to become what DSD wanted to be, but did not, that did not actually become. Now, what is so cool? Well, the cool thing about high sample rates is that they, whereas they do use a little bit of filters in the chip, these are not the, the long and deep filters with very, very long time transient responses. These are effectively, uh, we are taking the signal as if almost directly from the modulator with a small amount of filtering, very, very gentle. We're able to convert it to 384 kilohertz PCM, and we are able to go away from the problems with the upsampling and the downsampling. We now, because it's a PCM format, we now become compatible with all the mastering plugins. And it is now a format that's easily stored and distributable in, in files. You can store them in WAV files, you can store them in FLAG files. 
and that's something that makes it very compatible with the modern internet age. And because of the very, very dense sampling in time, it reproduces the time response, the trenchant, a lot better, which is thought to be responsible for creating a sound which comes much closer to the analog sound that the digital has always wanted to reproduce. So now, very, very shortly, the advantages of higher sample rates. It allows for frequency response much above 20 kilohertz. Now, this is a little bit um, controversial issue. Some people think it matters. Some people think it don't. Your dog will hear it for sure. You may not. It reduces the processing uh, distortions in the DAX. It improves the mastering, and it comes closer to the analog sound. So now, what can you do with the stuff? Well, one of the things you want to do with the stuff is if you are an LP lover, you have some records, it would be nice to digitize them at much higher sample rates because it's going to sound a lot closer to your original LP. Now, what kind of equipment can you use with it? There's a few, um, few things available on the market, including our own unit that we're going to be showing. We are showing it today and that's called Rubicon. It's a 384 kilohertz mastering and processing center for audiophile. You have 384 kilohertz A to D converter, D to A, you have a USB interface, you have an atomic clock that takes care of the jitter issues, and you have a nice headphone preamp. So come out, check out this unit, and I'm going to pass the microphone to the next presenter that's going to talk a little bit about how are the high sample rate recordings actually mastered?